Well, a couple of things are changing. For the patients with hepatitis C, they can look forward to a transplant as a cure and not have to face persistence of hepatitis C after their liver transplant. And that is um, huge because up to a third of patients who have a liver transplant with hepatitis C end up with recurrent cirrhosis because the transplant doesn't cure the hepatitis C. So uh, this makes the uh, liver transplants for patients with hepatitis C far more successful in the long term. Uh, there were certain types of donor organs that uh, weren't good for patients with hepatitis C because the risk of recurrence uh, was very high with those organs, particularly livers from older donors, which are great livers for patients who don't have hepatitis C but are really prone to recurrent hepatitis C. And with the new antiviral drugs, uh, that's no longer a concern. We can give uh, all sorts of liver donors to patients with hepatitis C and still have a long-term cure. So the patients with hepatitis C uh, do better in the long term and they have greater access to uh, organs. And then the big picture is that uh, some patients with hepatitis C will not progress to needing liver transplant because their livers will uh, improve uh, on antiviral therapy and so they may come off the transplant wait list and other patients with hepatitis C who are treated early now won't even progress to the uh, point where they need to be put on the wait list. So fewer transplants will be needed for patients with hepatitis C and that'll provide uh, more livers for the multitude of other patients who need liver transplant. It's really probably the greatest change in, uh, in, you know, in my field in over a decade easily. Well, that'd be great if it would um, for a reason like this, but there's such need for transplant for patients who don't have hepatitis C uh, that um, I think we'll still have a shortage of livers, especially with the rising epidemic of um, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, uh, fatty, you know, fatty liver disease, uh, end-stage liver disease from that. So we have, um, you know, we have about 15,000 patients with you know, reasonable melds on the wait list and we provide about 6,000 liver transplants a year. So um, if we took everybody off the list who had hepatitis C, we'd still have a shortage. You know, we, we can make rounds and see a patient who had a liver transplant and has uh, got a second chance and thriving and see them in our clinics and their families and, you know, all the good that comes from, from an organ transplant and a minute later be rounding on a patient who, um, you know, is, uh, is at death's door and we know is not going to get an offer or is too sick to get that offer, uh, who even days to weeks earlier might have been transplantable. But um, severe liver disease progresses really quickly and it's, um, you know, it's very uh, humbling and uh, to, to, we can do so much to cure people, but the ultimate thing, which is the spare parts we just don't have and it's, uh, it's very frustrating. So there's a lot of discussion about the price of the medication, but I think that um, in the grand scheme of things, that's, that's, a, that's the smaller piece of the big puzzle, which is that there's a cure for such a serious epidemic that affects you know, over 3% of the population and is uh, so devastating. The cost of end-stage liver disease is incredibly high. Uh, the cost of organ transplant is incredibly high. The cost of uh, liver cancer, which develops in patients with untreated hepatitis C, is very high. So, uh, you know, as a nation looking at expenditures for, for health care, it makes sense to use the antivirals to treat patients with hepatitis C. Now, for the four patient who's trying to get insurance to, you know, cough up the bucks, or for the state health commissioners to come up with the funds to, you know, pay for their, their uh, uh, Medicaid population is, is a challenge. I don't think we'll bankrupt us. I think that you know the homeless people are non-compliant by and large, and so I don't I don't think that um, I don't think that the problem there is is the um, cost of the drug. It's much more complicated than that. So I don't know how practical it is to treat those patients who really need some pretty close follow-up. Um, 
I mean, they have a tough life and they're missing a lot of things in life, and this may be a, 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 just a small piece of the big, you know, big picture. But um, uh, you know, there's discussion uh, with the um, Secretary of Health uh, to have federal government um, help to defray state uh, coffers to pay for these. There's some legislators thinking of um, introducing federal legislation about this. There are other antivirals coming to market, so the more competition there is, I think uh, we'll probably see prices come down. Um, so I think that the, uh, yeah, but the, uh, a lot of these antivirals took a decade or so to develop. Many, many uh, attempted uh, treatments failed. And so the, uh, the pharma industry does have a, um, you know, a challenge. I'm not saying that they're going broke because this is a profitable business, but it is a very expensive business. Um, to bring a drug to market like this takes, you know, in excess of a decade. So we want to make sure that we don't disincentivize our innovators and our pharmaceutical industry from looking to develop new drugs. Uh, we have to make sure that they have some incentive to do that.